I want to officially welcome you, Dr. Edmund Gordon, and you are um, preeminent in so many ways. I mean, for those who uh, may hear your name for the first time, little do they know that you have been associated with so many universities, emeritus status, um, Harvard, Yale, Columbia, Yeshiva, the list goes on, and uh, in, in your works, your books. And I you know, found out you had at least 86 boxes of papers in the Schomburg Library. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're really very, very uh, important to the work we're doing. And so the audience too, Dr. Gordon has been a signature in so many ways around pedagogy and practice, particularly of underserved youth. You know, he's, was, he worked in the Johnson administration, helped with Head Start, development of Head Start. And also um, the term we use quite ubiquitously today, the achievement gap, Dr. Gordon had something to do with that term. But the term that I use, and Dr. Gordon, you may remember, I called you one, you may or may not remember, I called you one, one year after we um, started COSBOC, Coalition of Schools Educating Boys of Color, and I said, Dr. Gordon, um, if you do not mind, I would love to use the term that you use quite often, affirmative development. Oh, and yes. I remember part that. Of, part of, uh, Dr. Gordon said, um, sure, you can use it. The affirmative development of academic ability is one of your terms. So the Kozbach mission statement is really built on that use of affirmative development. Only we say All the right. affirmative, social, emotional, cultural, and academic development of boys and young men of color. So I wanna thank you for allowing right us to use that term. <laughs> you're, you're welcome. And, and tell me, the lady? Yes, yes sir. <laughs> Why don't you introduce yourself, Jamaica? Yes, sir. Uh, my name is uh, Jamaica Jackson. Um, I'm here in Austin, Texas area. Um, oh, I have a son down there. Yes, sir. Um, I also work in education as well. And a lot of my focus is around the affirmative development, um, as well as uh, learning centered engagement. And so I've partnered with Colesbach uh, as a media consultant. And so I'll be helping put together the video, edit it down uh, for the anniversary coming up. <laughs> Welcome. Yeah, so I'm just excited to even be in this space, just to even <laughs> hear what you all are about to talk about. So uh, thank you for saying yes, and thank you for having me. And she's very modest, Dr. Gordon. I mean, she's <laughs> an athlete. She's a former military. Uh, she's a photographer. So, you know, she has an extensive background, and she's just been a wonderful blessing to, to Coast Park. I see. Okay. <laughs> well, if you're hanging out with Ron, you got to be doing something. <laughs> <laughs> look, I, look, I appreciate that. I hope I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let me open up, Dr. Gordon, just by asking you, you know, you had some tremendous mentors in your life. Two of them in particular that I would just want to ask you to comment on. One was Dr. Elaine Leroy Locke. Um, and growing in Philadelphia, growing up in Philadelphia, there's many schools named after the Dr. Locke. Right. And I know that he had something to do with the Harlem Renaissance. And then, lest I not forget, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois. Du Bois. Okay. And um, what, can you share with the audience a little bit about what their mentoring meant to you? Yeah, I, I never tire of talking about these uh, two people who I claim as uh, mentors. I hope they took enough note of me that if you caught up with them up in heaven or somewhere, they would uh, remember me as a mentee. But my uh, encounters with them actually began with uh, Elaine, Elaine Locke. Locke was professor of philosophy at Howard mm -hmm. when I was an undergraduate. And after three semesters at Howard, 
I was called into the dean's office and expelled for poor scholarship. Wow. And I was walking out of the dean's office. Locke's office was across the hall uh, from him and Locke was coming out of his office and he didn't know me, but he must have noted how crestfallen I was because he wanted to know what, it, what was wrong. And we went back into his office and had a long talk. It ended up with his uh, saying there was nothing that we could do about the expulsion. We had to follow it. But this says, Gordon, the first thing you do when you come back is come to my office. And I did that. And he kind of took me under his wing and taught me how to be a student. Mm. He says, there's nothing wrong with your brain. Your problems are with your habits. You're not, uh -huh. you're not following the, the, the right study habits. You're not using it to, to study. So that the remainder of my time at Howard, uh, I was a frequent visitor in uh, Locke's office, uh, sometimes at his uh, house for supper. And uh, he um, taught me how to read a book. He taught me how to write a, a, a research paper. Uh, I probably, one of the things I remember him most for is saying to me one day, uh, how much time do you give to listening? And you know, I, they don't, oh, I, I listen, but we went into a long discussion of listening. Wow. And he kind of gave me some clues about how you listen, particularly to a boring lecture, he said. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my parents had been educated people, but we had been very privileged people in a southern, a segregated southern town. And I discovered at Howard that I had gone through elementary and high school there, not really learning how to be a student, mm. but I was regarded as an honor student. I think I was either second or third in my graduating class. But that was because being Dr. Gordon's son, my teachers just gave me good marks. They expected me to do well. And I got to Howard not knowing how to do well. The thing I did know how to do was to be a social being. And I was <laughs> spent those first three semesters socializing. Locke Lock. rescued me. Mm -hmm. The encounter with uh, Du Bois was much, much later. I was working on my doctorate when I met him. Mm -hmm. uh, about 1951 or 52, I had come to New York to uh, do my doctorate at uh, Teachers College, uh, Columbia. And I had a job as the psychologist in a children's uh, a pediatric clinic at the Jewish hospital down in Brooklyn. And my chief, the chief psychiatrist there, I think it was Wordis who told me one day that he, his neighbor was an interesting black man named Du Bois. <laughs> and wow. I told Wordis how much I had admired uh, Du Bois' work all these years. Anyway, he arranged a uh, meeting for us. And somehow Du Bois and I hit it off so that from about 51 until 57 or 58, when he left this country for Ghana, I think he thought of me as his young assistant because when he needed to be escorted somewhere or even on some of his uh, travels, I uh, helped him. But I 
referred to him as my strongest mentor because I think it was during the period of encounters with him that I considered that I really became a scholar. Mm. I became a decent student under Locke, but I became a scholar under uh, Du Bois. It was uh, with Du Bois that I first learned the importance of context, C-O-N-T-X-T. Du Bois felt that if you didn't understand the context out of which a phenomenon had developed and the context in which you were encountering it, you didn't really understand the phenomenon mm -hmm. because he felt that context greatly shaped whatever you were doing. Mm -hmm. He also had this notion that perspective, the way in which people think about it was important. I hadn't en encountered those notions. Uh, I think Locke said a bit about perspective, but I hadn't really focused on them as important in one's approach to thinking until uh, I met uh, Du Bois and we had many, many uh, uh, talk, conversation, debate over lunch or over supper and he would hold forth. He believed that if you were gonna talk about or write about a phenomenon and you didn't know the history which formed the context of it, again, you didn't fully understand it. And I recall from his lectures and many of his writings, he always begins with the historical context out of which it, is, uh, it has come. And mm -hmm. understanding that, he says, is the first part of uh, knowing it and understanding. We, we know it was also with him that I learned the difference between knowing and understanding. And knowing and understanding. Right, mm -hmm. he says you can, you can have a lot of facts but if you don't know the relations between them and what they mean to different people in different contexts, you don't really know them, he says. Well, you know, Dr. Gordon, I, I hope that those who listen and will have young men listening, will have their teachers listening, will have their mentors listening, you know, across the generational spectrum, you just drop some serious pearls of wisdom about context, perspective, you know, knowing from whence someone's background is before you um, determine what their fate and future might be. I right. think the boys said to you, um, I will encourage you to understand how, how is it that some students can succeed despite the challenges that have faced them. That still holds true today. Is that not right, Dr. Gordon? Absolutely. Uh, you must have been looking at my bio. I've got a whole string of research. I call it defiers, defiers of negative prediction. And it's my, uh, oh, 10, 15 years I spent studying black men who had gone on to high achievement. And if you had known them 10, 15, 20 years earlier, you would have been sure they were going to fail. So they were predicted to fail, but they went on to high great mm. success. Mm. And why? Mm -hmm. I don't know which of the correlates I would attach greatest importance to. But I think I like to talk most about relatedness, having people in your life who uh, open the door for you, who mm -hmm. help you, who guide you, who, who, who correct you. Uh, 
uh, maybe uh, I like that one so much because that's the story of my life. I was fortunate to have remarkable people in my life, beginning with my uh, parents. And much of my success in life, I think, uh, has to be attributed to the people in my life who influenced, who, who helped me. Wow. And as I approach 100, I'm going to be 100 in June. June 21st. Right, right. Wow. I realize that, wow. that it is not just the people who influence me, but I learned so much from the people I have influenced. <laughs> List, listening to them, relating to them, helping them, and viewing that a part of my role in life is to extend that hand. You learn a great deal as you're helping somebody else. And well, you know, you discover that they in turn help you. That's right. It, it, it's a reciprocity in full effect. Absolutely. I, 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 and I tell you, Dr. Gordon, I mean, as you're speaking, it's resonating so much with me. And I know Jamaica as well. Jamaica is, you know, much younger than we are, but she, I know this is resonating with her as well. But I remember, because I'm going to just piggyback on something you said about relatedness. And a friend of yours who also was another mentor of mine, Dr. James Comer, oh, right. used to always remind me and those that worked with him about relationships, relationships, relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I look back over my life and we want the young men who are going to be viewing this video to think about the relationships, the people, maybe their parents, maybe a teacher, or maybe what we used to call in the neighborhood, fictive kin. No blood relationship, but they might as well have been. All right, all right. So this is what you're speaking to, and I think it's amazing. Let me ask you this question. Our organization is 15 years old. And as I said, when we opened, we are trying to affirmatively advance the social, emotional, and cultural, and academic development of boys and young men of color. What advice, given some of your experiences and just what you said, what advice would you give to an organization like ours? We work with teachers and principals and families across the nation. What advice would you give us to continue this work that, that maybe we need to hear even more? Ron, for a number of years now, I have uh, talked and written about something I call intellective competence, intellective competence. And what I am talking about is what your grandma would have probably called uh, common sense. Uh, the capacity to th think through, to pay attention to things, to understand the relations between them, and to apply that understanding to, to problem solving. I still think that that probably is the core. Mm. But I realize, particularly in thinking about these young men who got off to a poor start, one does have to place very close to intellective competence and maybe even above it, the capacity to extend oneself to uh, include somebody else. Hmm. What, what we were just talking about, the capacity mm -hmm. to relate to other, other people. We've got some smart people out there but they seem to falter when it comes to 
using themselves in relation to other people or even using other people in relation to their uh, goals. Mm -hmm. When you were talking about these people uh, who are important in our lives, we got to include in that peers, the people ah. sitting next to us. And if you view as uh, Christ would say, your responsibility for the other person, mm -hmm. that reciprocity begins to come into play. And most of us, or maybe I'll put it differently, very few of us achieve a great deal without the help of somebody. I certainly know in my life, there's always been somebody helping me do things. Uh, yes, probably indeed. most important uh, being uh, my wife. Probably mm -hmm. the most important decision and choice I ever made was, was that one. But as I think back to my accomplishments, the things that we did as we joined uh, hands to raise a family together and to help each other. So I think I would still give a lot of attention to what I call intellective competence, but pushing it very hard would be relationships. I love it. I love it. And I love the fact that <clears throat> good old fashioned common sense, or as my mother used to say, mother wit still holds true as in, in, in importance. So Dr. Gordon, I think this will be our last question for you. Um, our theme <clears throat> for our 15th anniversary event, which will take place on May 26 and 27, uh, by the time this is recorded, people will, will be in the midst of it. Our theme is Sankofa Rising, the journey from a moment to a movement. And I'll tell you why I selected that theme. Because, you know, in my years as an educator, I was a teacher, I was a principal, I never thought that I, at the age of 60, when I started Kozbot, that this was going to be my calling for the 15 years. <laughs> and I look back over my career, which is that act of Sankofa, looking back in order to go forward, as you know. And I remember and I start thinking about all the sort of the breadcrumbs that led me to this point. That, <laughs> for example, my mother, uh, who never went to college, but certainly was well qualified if she had the opportunity, used to nightly inoculate me, as I say it, with a special vaccine that was from the works of Langston Hughes. Wow. She used to remember, she was, she, she was a poet, she loved poetry, and she used to recite to me night after night, mother to son. And I was a little boy and I didn't know quite why she kept doing it night after night until later on I found out the reason not to turn back, right? Because life is not a crystal stair. And then I think about one of my students, which I often talk about, talk about him. His name is Kevin Johnson. And he was one of my star students in junior high school now called middle school. And we used to talk about his future. And when I left Philadelphia to come to Boston, I lost track of him. I, by that time, I was eight, it was eight years later, I was a principal in Cambridge. And one day I get a letter in the mail and it was from someone who was in a penitentiary. So I opened the letter up, I read the letter and it said, Mr. Walker, you may not remember me, but this is your former student, Kevin Johnson. I'm incarcerated for a crime I did not do, and I'm incarcerated for life without parole. But I remember this, that you always told me to fight for what's important. 
So I'm fighting for my freedom. You always told me the importance of education. And so I'm getting my GED and I'm working in a penitentiary school. Now, this is a long story short. That was in 1986 when he first wrote me. And 10 years later, and well, 20 years later, in 2006, I get a letter and a phone call from the principal of that penitentiary school where inmate Johnson is working. And she said the following, inmate Johnson has been a model worker and he's convinced me that you should be the keynote speaker for the 100 men getting their GEDs in this prison. Uh -huh. And so I went to the prison, saw my former student, made my keynote speech, but I followed Dr. Gordon. This is this is sort of the, the, the tipping point. I followed an inmate who was the valedictorian. And what he said, he said, although I'm incarcerated, although I'm a lifer, although they call me a felon, I am free because I'm educated. He got his GED and college credit. That was the day, September 2006, that I started Kozbach. So uh -huh. I say that I gave you that story only because as I look back and retrieve those things in order to think what we need to do to advance the movement, that was from the moment to the movement. So I guess I, I want to ask you in closing. What do you think about these Sankofa moments that we should hold on to? Obviously, I want to endorse what you're saying. And I'm debating whether to take it where my association takes me or take it into religion. And maybe I'll do both. Hmm. I don't remember when it was that I first ran into the uh, analysis of the difference between reflection, R-E-F-L-E-C-T-I-O-N, where one is reflecting on the past, kind of reviewing, remembering, revisiting. And the other word is Reflexivity, R E F L E X I V I T Y, uh, mm -hmm. philosophical term. The first is important, that is, we remember the past, we celebrate the past, we revisit it, but we don't remain so much in the past that it limits our move, move forward. Mm. Reflexivity as opposed to reflectivity speaks to that difference. With reflexivity, one is revisiting the past, not just to celebrate it, but to analyze it and to learn from it. Mm. What is it about? what happened in this period? What should I take from it as being important? What should I you know, leave off as having learned that I, I don't need that? And what is it that I learned how to do with my memory of the past mm. to shape the future? Mm. So far. I, think you're wise, you're smart in building your program around that. And I hope you are, are successful in keeping it at the center of your curriculum with uh, a, an inspiration for your kids. It certainly helps us in times of trouble because all of us will at some point encounter some defeats, some not so great moments. But if you can learn from them, 
and learn how to use that to build an even better uh, future. I suppose in the first is to build a better nest. You make where you are better based upon your understanding of your past. Mm -hmm. But you make your future even better by learning not to repeat those mistakes from the past, but to take your new learnings to climb even higher. Right? Wow. Wow. And I'm saying, wow, again, I mean, Jamaica, you, you have experienced, you know, this is a blessing. This is a gift. Just to hear Dr. Gordon wax and share these thoughts. And it all ties together with what we're trying to do. We, you know, we've taken wisdom, advice from Dr. Gordon, I could say even some of his terms, affirmative development, right. and we're moving it forward, you know, passing it along. Mm -hmm. And Jamaica, I know you have a two-year-older, you know, just think about what you've learned just this evening, <laughs> just right? Yes, what exactly. you would take and share with him. Oh man, I, I have goosebumps to be completely honest, listening to this conversation because it's resonating so much for me, right? Because it is important to look at your past and analyze it so that way you can deliberately make choices for yourself moving forward that are going to benefit you as well as the life you wish to have, right? Because if you can see it, you can achieve it. Just got to get out of your way to do so. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So thank you so much for this. This has been, I can't even You're put words to welcome. it. <laughs> Good luck and, and, with your young one. Thank yes, you so and, much. <laughs> and, and, and Jamaica, you know, and Dr. Gordon, we will certainly uh, make uh, the edited version available to you. Oh, please do. Um, yes, my, please. My kids will appreciate that. Yes. yes, let's make sure we do that, Jamaica. I will. I will. And communicate with Cassandra. We want to thank Cassandra very much for being patient with us and organizing this time. Yes. We really appreciate thank that. Would one of you send me a an email reminder of that May 27th? 26, 26? and 27th. Yes, sir. Yeah, yes. we cer we certainly will, and we want if you are able to join us to hear because we're going to have a cast of other folks who have also presented. Some of them you know, Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings. Oh yes, uh, Christopher Emden. Uh -huh. um, you know, you so we're gonna them? Have Emden, uh, Jim Coma. Are you? Well, gonna... uh, you know, I, I'm gonna reach out to Dr. Coma and see what I can get him as well. So mm -hmm. we're gonna have um, cross generational. Um, we're gonna have some comedy because yeah. we can't do this work without laughing sometimes. Right, right, <laughs> so right. We want to make sure. So Jamaica, we want to make sure Dr. Gordon gets the invite. Yes, sir. Um, yes, sir. I'll talk to him. Yeah. Right. All right. Well, thank you very much. And thank see you. you again. All right. <laughs> thank All you right. so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.